Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Prefish's presentation today. We are very pleased to be part of the International Week organized by the Department for Business and Trade uh, in the UK government. And we are very pleased to, to see over 35 registrations for this webinar. Some may be coming a little bit later, but um, <clears throat> we're going to start now. Today, we'll have one hour together, including about 50 minutes presentation by me my, and my colleague, Jane. And then we will take a, a five to 10 minutes uh, Q&A session. Um, if you have questions anytime, please do type in chat. Um, but uh, at the end, we'll take them together. You're also welcome to raise your hand, unmute yourself, and uh, then you can speak uh, uh, in uh, person as well. So the session is recorded um, mainly so that we can uh, share it afterwards for those who missed, who would like to uh, come. And also, we will be writing up a full article of the topics we cover today. We're also sharing on our social media in LinkedIn. If you um, follow us, that you will be able to see all that as well. So, um, oops. So uh, just a, a bit first about Prefish, about our company. We are based in Cambridge. Uh, we cover uh, UK, uh, all across the nine regions, but also uh, we cover Europe, we have clients uh, in America as well. So we are mainly uh, organizing our services around three portfolio. So the consulting side is very much for bespoke uh, services for complex work or when ongoing support is needed. This can be entering the market to finding partners to how to engage the Chinese digital uh, marketing space, but also find uh, due diligence and finding manufacturers, as well as ongoing uh, problems that we can help to advise. And then intellectual properties, uh, a new portfolio of our service, but growing rapidly. So this is a, through a strategic investor of ours, uh, China uh, Sinoface IP Group. We provide a full range of IP services to help protect but more importantly for us is also to work with IP owners to commercialize intellectual property in China safely and in a way that is otherwise very difficult to achieve. Uh, finally, for those uh, ad hoc projects and all for clients who uh, uh, like to know exactly the budget beforehand, they can use our digital service platform where we have uh, uh, all the essential services from market research to um, translation to marketing and that uh, is also available all the time at uh, 24 7. so today the topic uh, will be divided in two parts uh, myself will be mainly focusing on the economic trends of China, macroeconomic level, but also looking at core sectors and look at where the opportunities lies. And then I will pass it to my colleague, Jin mm. Ru, who will talk about the practical side of doing business in China, um, particularly all those uh, matters that are uh, still of concern to foreign companies. These are all real case studies as well. So a little bit about myself, uh, particularly now I can see more people joining. Uh, I'm Ting Zhang, I'm the founder and CEO of Crayfish. And uh, I have lived uh, in the UK for 26 uh, years. And uh, among this uh, time, um, I've been uh, advising uh, UK companies in doing business in, in China, mainly with the focus on tech, but uh, I've also worked with uh, clients in consumer goods, retail, education, and financial institutions as well. Um, so now what I would like to start is really to take a look at a very high level of China's GDP, because everyone know China has the fastest growth in the world. Although after a long three years pandemic control, China has experienced a severe slowdown. Even this year, the growth has been uh, fluctuating as you can see. Um, it has a good start, very strong start. Uh, but then the, in the second quarter, the, the growth slows down, even though it's still growing, it's kind of disappointing to many people who expect China to recover much faster. 
This is mainly because in China, there's insufficient demand, not just uh, from the local uh, consumers, but also abroad in terms of export as well. And uh, this is, of course, uh, tied with the generally the global business uh, climate as well. I met a few Chinese entrepreneurs and business people visiting recently and asked them how's the situation on the ground in China because I visited a few months ago. But things in China has been uh, evolving quite uh, a lot uh, this year. So they all say it's quite difficult um, this year um, for their own business because of the general slowdown. However, most people I spoke to remain optimistic for the recovery, even though they think it would take longer. Um, but experts-wise, um, they all think that China's economy may need uh, a boost from the government, which we are going to look at uh, in a bit. Um, however, the general cons uh, con uh, consensus that China's economy is stabilizing, the growth is still going and is sustainable. So if we look at other uh, economic um, indicators, we can see that um, uh, the uh, in terms of investment, it has also increased, except in the um, real estate property market. The reason we actually mention this here is although for many of you here, um, real estate real estate market may not be something you're directly involved or related, it actually has in China a big impact and spillover effects on many aspects of the industry. For example, it directly uh, impact uh, the consumer spending, uh, how they feel their wealth going, because most of Chinese people, um, their home ownership is the biggest asset. So when the price, house price comes down, they don't want to spend as much, and that um, influenced the whole uh, consumer confidence. Um, and then also there's a banking system uh, related to the real estate uh, real estate uh, property market. For example, recently there's a two high level, high profile defaults from Evergrande and Country Garden. Both are leading uh, real estate developers um, in the market. In terms of foreign trade, um, it has uh, sort of uh, grown in the first half, but then overall this year, the, the three quarters seem to have seen a drop. Um, this is also related to globally, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty, uh, geopolitics and wars. Uh, so China is uh, itself not insulated from the global economy. So if we uh, look at um, China's uh, ongoing challenges are facing, because uh, many of these are interlinked. Um, and uh, it, it's very important to understand these challenges for China, for us, um, for those who are actively looking at China as a market. So we categorize China's uh, sort of main challenge into three sections, uh, security stability, economic slowdown, and geopolitical tensions. So this um, continues to affect China's role in the global economy. I won't go into all the details. Uh, we will have an article with more details if you'd like to read more. But very briefly, um, de-risking uh, or decoupling, uh, for many people, they're thinking about the West is de-risking or decoupling from China. But in fact, it's not just the West to, uh, doing that. China it's doing its own de-risking as well. And that's probably uh, not commonly known by people who are not very familiar uh, with what's happening in China. For example, the government has this uh, dual circulation strategy, uh, which they have um, uh, started saying this uh, from a couple of years ago. Essentially, it's saying that uh, the Chinese domestic economy should be the mainstay versus the international uh, economy. However, um, how to maintain that linkage and balance this uh, external and internal cycles uh, and how to reinforce the linkage is actually quite a task for the Chinese government and they have to continue and play that balancing act. And in terms of domestic stability, this we talk about social stability, uh, a lot of them are also, also caused by uh, uh -huh increasing wealth gaps, 
and there's also employment uh, issues in China very high young people uh, are employed unemployed and so so overall for China the Chinese government um, to sustain the post covid recovery is key to ensure social st stability and then very uh, briefly on supply chain again we're not talking about the west um, <clears throat> moving away from uh, china uh, supply chain this is for china itself also to uh more so making their supply chain more secure for example china imports a lot of uh, food commodity energy from the west uh, from outside china and and so for them to how to diversify that with international partners to mitigate the supply chain task is also a challenge for them. For example, recently they put temporary export control on graphite material and related products. And this can also be seen as part of the securitizing their own supply chain or versus um, the global supply chain. In terms of economy, we mentioned that uh, the economy is uh, sort of slowing down its growth this year, but long-term wise, China is still growing, even though at a lower uh, level, and how to make, sustain that. In the meantime, sustain at a level that's enabled China to maintain uh, the, the minimum level to ensure uh, the adequate employment, uh, and as I mentioned, such as uh, social stability is a, is a uh, main challenge. We've already mentioned unemployment. Uh, side um, and then in terms of debt, China has a quite high ratio of debt to GDP. In fact, it's um, somewhat seventy five percent. But of course, if include the local government financing, then the higher is even higher. So it's causing um, some concern for uh, China observers, but also uh, a challenge for the government, especially when it wants to. Uh, promote more um, <clears throat> investment stimulus in the coming years. This is uh, also the property market bubble, as we mentioned, is fluctuating, and that's uh, causing a lot of strains of the financial system. Um, and uh, investment uh, side, uh, Chinese government is looking to uh, encourage more investment from foreign uh, investors in terms of FDI, but also internally try to stimulate uh, private investment, but it's still a challenge. Uh, doesn't mean that the government say, hey, we want more investment, and, and then therefore the investment is coming. It's a constant effort to, uh, for China to do that. Uh, without saying everyone would know the geopolitical tensions are really a big um, uh, influence for uh, China uh, and, and for all of those uh, us included uh, that are doing business with China and in China. Um, and I won't go into all the details um, of Taiwan, uh, Russian Ukraine or Gaza crisis, but these are all relevant because uh, it will affect China's uh, relationship with uh, certain regions or with countries and uh, particularly related to energy supply security, and with U.S., um, the ongoing trade mm -hmm. war, the U.S. attempts to decouple with China by various industries, such as the CHIP Act. And of course, next year, there will be elections happening in U.S., in, in Taiwan, and of course, here in the U.K. as well. This all throwing uncertainty for China in terms of its international relations outlook. Mm. But amid all these uh, tensions, there are some positive development ongoing in uh, global climate change initiatives. And recently, the AI Global Summit, where China is now committed to be part of the global ecosystem. So China is uh, very different uh, in terms of how economy is run, in, in terms of how the state's role in the economy versus a free market economy. And therefore, uh, we would like to uh, talk a little bit more about recent reforms and policy. And you can see that all this in the last uh, uh, three, four months, and what kind of policy that has been in place. And in fact, what kind of effect uh, they have been um, bringing in. 
for example, in July, the uh, policy was very much boost confidence in private sector because uh, the last two years, China had cracked down a lot of private sector companies from um, uh, you know, the likes of Alibaba to DD was the taxi hailing um, app, to games companies, to education. Uh, and then there's a big um, uh, drop in the private sector investment. And therefore the government realized it has to re reinstall that confidence. And therefore we saw that uh, um, uh, after this, uh, this policy, we saw that Alibaba, for example, the, the founder of, um, uh, sorry, Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, came back to the front seat, and this is a lot uh, of um, uh, you know policies as well as activities in the private sector. At least in the private sector, they are seem to be more active. Although we have to yet to see whether that uh, um, effect will be um, sustained. And then later in the year, we also saw some specific policies to uh, stimulate domestic consumption. Um, this would be, uh, for example, there is a new 15 minutes community service circles. Uh, essentially, uh, this is enable residents to find everything they need within 15 minutes of walk. That would include culture, uh, entertainment, leisure, uh, healthcare and fitness, um, so that uh, the purpose is get uh, people to spend more, save less, because China uh, has the world's highest saving uh, deposit saving rate, uh, mainly because people, um, a lot of time they feel uncertain, they don't want to spend money, so the government is doing a lot, trying to get them to spend more, and including at uh, county level, uh, where it's far from the big cities, so they want also uh, to help consumers to to access uh, the um, <clears throat> goods more easily, and then in in August, uh, government very much uh, uh, issued some policies to in encourage foreign investment, particularly looking at IP and cross border data flows. Uh, we will talk a little bit about foreign investment policies later. And then uh, in September, there's also um, tax uh, relief measures. So, uh, and then October, uh, where the mainly is talking about the debt, enabling government to issue more debt and, and therefore be able to put more into infrastructure and support local economy. So if you look at uh, the policy in fact, in September, for example, the total retail of uh, consumer goods has increased, even though it's a small, less than 1% higher growth rate over August. Uh, however, that shows that uh, the measures they had done in July, which is boost consumption, has some effect. So now what we would like to is really looking at some of sectors because the Chinese leadership priority is pushing investment innovation uh, in this core sectors, um, and uh, they would like to particularly help certain industries, and that has a bigger impact on the overall uh, uh, economy. So we are going to talk about manufacturing, TMT, healthcare, and edu education and edutech. So the first one is manufacturing. China, of course, everyone knows this world's biggest workshop for manufacturing for factories. So it's not surprising that it's making as almost a third of the global manufacturing output. However, in this year, the Chinese um, uh, manufacturing activity actually did not bounce back as quickly as the uh, market was expecting in terms of the PMI. As you can see, it, it went up uh, this year uh, gradually, but then in the uh, uh, last couple of months, it actually missed uh, the forecast. Um, so government actually respond very quickly. This is something the Chinese government is very efficient at. It, it noticed something, it's able to introduce a policy to try to solve that. And therefore in September, they actually um, uh, re removed all restrictions on foreign investment. And now there's they are dedicated measures to help foreign invested companies in China to seek resolutions if they have the intellectual property rights um, example, in French, or if they have a local government 
um, department trying to, you know, um, uh, make problems for them, they could uh, uh, actually come making those complaints uh, to a high levels and be able to enjoy dedicated support, uh, which is uh, something I think new. And uh, of course, we're yet to see how they actually in practically they work, but it's very uh, encouraging to see that. And uh, manufacturing is a big area. There's a lot of different sectors. We list some of the logos here that uh, maybe some of these you would uh, know, um, some of this you're probably not recognizing. Um, for example, the uh, BAIC, uh, that is uh, China's uh, one of the biggest uh, automotive uh, uh, manufacturers. There's a uh, Giga device, it's a big hardware manufacturer. Xiaomi, probably a lot of people know, it's a smartphone. It's the almost like equivalent of iPhone in China. And this Noriko, which is a Chinese uh, silver big uh, industry company. There's a chemical, Sinochem, there's BOE, which is electronics uh, companies. And then, uh, although we mentioned that uh, manufacturing in general this year has not been growing that fast, EV actually stands out. It's been uh, growing really rapidly um, this year. When we had the one of the board directors of BYD, China's biggest EV company, uh, visiting Cambridge um, uh, in September, he mentioned that they're almost doubling their sales globally this uh, this year compared to last year and again next year. It's just a phenomenal growth. So in terms of TMT, um, that is uh, telecom uh, media and uh, um, technology. So China has its own uh, like NASDAQ equivalent of stock market uh, called the second at uh, the science and technology board. And, and, uh, and that's an indicator of how active or how successful this sector uh, uh, is. So we can see that in the first quarter, uh, sorry, the first half a year, um, although there's, uh, there's still healthy sort of pipelines of companies uh, went public, it has almost uh, reduced by half from, uh, from last year. So this uh, is a, um, a delayed effect of uh, what happened during last two years of the uh, crackling down on tech companies. Um, but also there's also restricting uh, the uh, data um, flow, for example, more strict um, policy in um, data privacy. This is all influencing the TMT sector, which is very much data driven. And then uh, in terms of the value of this company's risk when the list has also decreased, although we see a slight uh, uh, increase um, uh, the second uh, half a year will be, and that is indicating the market is uh, putting more confidence into this sector. And uh, in terms of the companies, as you can see that um, there's uh, big names, you know, uh, Tencent and uh, Alibaba, but also there are some, uh, there are some companies probably less likely that you know that in, uh, in terms of, um, uh, for example, um, Cloudwork, which is a man machine, human machine coordination platform. There's a MIG V. This is third party authentication software. So China uh, is probably the, uh, in terms of speed, probably is the fastest in the world for a company to grow from, uh, uh, from a, a startup to unicorn status. And that is because the market is huge to support such growth, but also the availability of, uh, of funds as well. And China is um, becoming a main dominant power in AI and the government is putting even more money into computer computing power. And, um, and so this sector has enormous uh, growth um, in the coming years. Healthcare has uh, um, always been a big sector in China, although it has been uh, troubled by a uh, rampant corruption and uh, uh, and um, a lot of problems in the supply chain. So the government this year has uh, really tackled this by uh, cracking down um, those um, corruption and therefore uh, 
one of the downside is that uh, the companies uh, have found it harder to uh, grow. Uh, but over, in the longer term, this is good for the industry, and the and the industry is set still to uh, grow. And again, here you can see some of the uh, leading players in the industry. Uh, for example, Mandarin uh, or you call Mandarin, they are China's biggest medical um, device provider, almost like China's equivalent of GE. And then there's Wush Aptech. They are in R and D services. And, uh, and then some number of other biotech companies and pharma, uh, biopharma companies. Finally, uh, I know that today we have uh, quite a, uh, a few uh, attendants uh, from uh, the education sector and edtech. This is uh, in fact one of our also uh, core sectors for crayfish. We have worked uh, with a lot of companies in this, in this sector. Uh, over the last few years, a particular last two years has been very difficult for companies in this sector, not just for Western companies into China, but for the Chinese companies as well. Um, the main thing what happened was the Chinese government has has uh, decided to consolidate the market and uh, and uh, particularly restrict uh, the kind of um, they call double reduction policy is uh, restricting all the after school tutoring and extracurriculum activities. The rationale for that is because less parents, young parents are willing to have children, even though China has abolished the one child policy. It's just too expensive to raise a child in China or children, particularly because culturally, uh, Chinese um, parents are very competitive uh, and they want their children to receive the highest education that they can afford. And uh, statistics shows that Chinese parents spend nearly half of their savings um, on average to um, spend on their children's education. It's enormous and it's causing a lot of stress um, for the Chinese um, parents. And therefore, we have seen that Chinese has a uh, population decline for the first time last year. And uh, this is causing a lot of concern for the government. And therefore, uh, the government had a knee-jerk reaction to basically cut almost everything in, in this field, um, in the uh, education side. Of course, that has a huge impact on the supply uh, of the education, that include edutech. Directly, we're seeing companies that have gone um, you know, out of business uh, in China, but also some companies are leaving China for that reason. They find it's hard to um, do business um, anymore in China with their existing business offer and business model. However, we shall say that this industry is still growing rapidly and uh, government is allowing now, uh, particularly in the vocational uh, education and some of the qualification non-core subjects such as art and uh, music uh, to uh, do business in China. And this is, uh, again, the rationale is, um, is for uh, China to uh, have a, a, a prepared skill force fit for what China's future economic uh, development needed. Um, they need more people who can uh, do, for example, manufacturing, who can uh, work in service industry, not just um, you know, to do AI, for example. And therefore, uh, there are opportunities, although this has evolved and it continuously evolves. So watch uh, this place. And now what I would like to now is looking at uh, in terms of coming year because we're nearly the end of uh, 2022. And uh, of course, there are uh, different um, projection rates for China's uh, GDP, but the consensus seemed to be lower than um, 5% uh, between 4.2, 4.6%. And for China, that is uh, still um, looks like uh, sustainable and it's able to um, sustain the level of uh, employment and uh, but the biggest uh, of course challenge is to continue to uh, attract 
private investment and uh, a foreign investment as well. So uh, in terms of geopolitics, uh, in terms of China's international um, relations or international economic climate, um, it's next week, in fact, in San Francisco, the APEC summit is going to happen. And, uh, and Xi Jinping is going to meet uh, Joe Biden. And uh, they are going to uh, try to uh, restore or, uh, how do you say, put back the US-China relationship uh, to a normal uh, tragedy, uh, to a normal track. And therefore, we hope we'll see some kind of uh, uh, normality and uh, able to see um, more trade uh, in a globally with, with, with China from that. Of course, there's also Australia and China recently uh, following the GM's uh, visit to China. Uh, it also seemed to have uh, lifted uh, a lot of the tensions. And in fact, uh, they, the two countries have promised to have a regular or annual uh, prime minister dialogue, which is so encouraging. We, I just wanted to highlight a sector, EV, out of all the sectors we have talked about, uh, particularly in 2024, this is a very important year uh, where we will see that uh, Chinese uh, EV companies will be dominating Europe in terms of uh, the market. Um, and uh, we will, of course, see what EU will have in terms of the uh, policy to, um, to deal with that. Um, but EVs uh, as a as an industry has a lot of um, uh, impact on the whole supply chain, whether it's on semiconductor or on the uh, chemical or or on the mechanics uh, engineering. There's a, a lot of uh, companies in in the UK, Europe that that are supplying into this um, sector. So it's a very important year for EV. And finally, uh, we touched upon um, um, real estate market is going to continue to um, see weaken uh, spending and uh, it's continuously going to be uh, fluctuating and it's not a priority uh, sector for government to rescue yet. So um, that is just to, to uh, bear in mind of that. Very quickly, we're going to talk about uh, the coming, um, uh, actually starting from today, China's uh, 20th uh, Central Committee, third plenum. So this kind of um, uh, com uh, meeting is very important because it sets the um, government policies for going forward and typically address the most burning issues. So here we can see there's uh, expected to be four areas that we're discussing. On self-reliance, uh, um, again, it's looking at uh, the supply chain and, and in, terms of, um, in terms of how China can uh, rely on its own technology, particularly on those core areas, not to be uh, uh, you know, continuously having a bottleneck from the Western's uh, um, ban of uh, access. And there's, of course, as I mentioned, the balancing act of China, because although it wants to be self-reliant, it cannot realistically do so. And, and instead, it has to rely on more innovation. And, uh, and, uh, and it doesn't, uh, it's not something that uh, it, China can catch up very quickly on those areas, and, and such as semiconductor, for example, so there's a lot of research funding going into innovation, and there's appetite still for foreign technology because, as I mentioned, they can't catch up so quickly. So there's a lot of partnership there. And uh, I won't mention much about the stability side the security, but in terms of economic growth, again, there's uh, government uh, is now helping to uh, uh, launch a lot more policies to stimulate the investment. So now, um, I think uh, if you have watched uh, all this, you would uh, probably uh, agree that China is a market that just too big to be no ignored. And uh, and the new prime uh, premier, China, uh, Li Qiang, has publicly been advocating and also launching measures to make China welcome foreign investment.
to keep the open door policy. And in terms of the uh, areas uh, that you can do as a business, is, of course, every company is different, but overall, the three areas, you can China can be a very important export destination for you to sell products or services, but it can also be a very important partner in your supply chain, whether it's um, manufacturing China for the Chinese market or for global market, or China is in a very good uh, position for you to access to the ACN markets, which are now also becoming a lot more um, active. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of uh, demand for uh, innovation, so there's a lot more opportunity in that as well, particularly after the three year when China was closed and, and now it had uh, sort of uh, uh, almost at a, a step set back with its own uh, international tech innovation collaboration. Of course, China um, manufacture and um, produce millions of, uh, of engineers every year, so it's the biggest talent pool. And that's also very helpful if a company is looking at doing research and R&D in China for its own international market as well. And in terms of the government attracting uh, foreign investment policy, um, I mentioned earlier on the government at national level, at sector level, uh, they have already um, had various policies, but in regional level in China, there's also policies that you can look at if you are interested in a particular area. For example, the GBA, the Great Bay Area, which is uh, uh, um, with the core cities of Shenzhen and uh, Guangzhou, Zhuhai, and, Hong, and Hong Kong, Macau, all that area uh, is China's biggest export. Uh, base, but also manufacturing base. And the government there is encouraging foreign investment by giving tax, a uh, very good tax relief, for example, kind of house allowance and the children education fees, uh, enjoy the tax relief on those, which is uh, all very uh, worthwhile uh, to look at. So I think uh, on that, um, I'm uh, I'm down with the microeconomic level. And uh, if you have questions, I will take that at the end of the presentation. But now I will pass it to uh, my colleague, Jing Ru, who will um, talk about the practical considerations uh, of operating in China with case studies. Jing, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jing. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've seen some familiar names already uh, today, uh, but for those who don't know me yet, uh, I'm Jane. I manage client relations and service delivery at Quickish.io. Uh, in the past few years, I have been speaking to many British and European companies in different industries to, to talk about their challenges and also concerns when they do business with China. Today, I like to share a few um, frequently asked questions and the solutions that my clients used to solve the puzzles um, in the Chinese market. Um, so firstly, the yes and the no questions. These are the very important questions to be answered um, before companies entering the Chinese market or if they want to target products or technologies to a new sector. So we all know, as Tim mentioned, China is a huge market not to be ignored. Um, but uh, also it's not necessarily many potentials for everyone. And then it's very necessary to ask questions relevant to your industry and the products. Is China a market for you? Or is it a good time to start? And uh, or if you have already been in the market, um, can you duplicate the success in another industry or in another format using the same approach? So that's that's basically the first few questions I was often asked when a companies are thinking about the Chinese market. So relevant to these questions, I have a story to share 
um, which is a client that has already set up its office in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong office actually look after its overall business in Great China region. And uh, in particular, the office look after the three channels and the wholesale uh, distributors. Its products are already been successful in many sectors, such as uh, like in uh, public uh, spaces, in architecture, infrastructure, and as, all, uh, as well as education. But um, as you all be aware of that, China is developing very quickly in the e-commerce space. And uh, my clients already have sensed the online trends for uh, even for B2B products. However, the timing to implement the e-commerce strategy for a B2B company is, is different, totally different to consumer goods. It can be now or later when the e-commerce uh, e market for its product is more mature. So the question to this customer is that they want to have a deep understanding of the current status of the e-commerce um, market relevant to its own product. So uh, what they, uh, how, how we help them is that we help them to carry out a combined desk research of these expert interviews in the same industries, but with e-commerce experience. So we, based on the research and interviews, we provided a, a report to analyze the situation and to share, share the findings that uh, um, served as a very important source um, for the client to make a strategic planning, as well as e-commerce is very different to the traditional trade channels. So they need to arrange their operations such as warehouse delivery and after sales uh, customer service as well. So uh, that's the first uh, few questions and case I want to share. And, um, and then secondly, once you've done your um, professional market research and you decided to enter the market, I think the most frequently asked questions are, what's the best way to go to China? Uh, what, what should be my uh, market entry strategy or my growth strategy? So there are, few, uh, there are few options when you are considering entry strategy or growth strategy, such as you can choose to set up in China, it can be a Wolfie or um, a representative office or a branch, or the second option is find local partners. It can be one or two uh, partners for your distribution, or they can be a sales agent or a manufacturer, or um, like uh, to help you to, to, to produce relevant uh, products. The third um, option can be you are selling direct to customers, um, but maybe that's more suitable for the consumer goods. Um, of course, there are other options as well, depending on which industries you are in. Like you can choose for licensing, or this is more for like a content or technology companies. Yeah. So depending on the stage of your business and uh, like uh, the features of your products, you may choose differently. Um, but many of my customers or the majority will go for like find a local partner or partners to cover different aspects um, in, in the Chinese market. Yeah, so um, actually like uh, working with partners have many advantages. Uh, for example, you can benefit from the partners um, local knowledge and uh, they may have already established channels and connections you will 
not need to worry a little bit uh, uh, more about uh, like uh, product uh, rest, uh, registration or how to um, navigate through the regulatory um, um, uh, landscape in China. Um, but it's, it's always difficult to, to find a like-minded uh, distributor uh, that uh, can take your products or technology for long term. Um, for example, I have clients that have worked with a distributor in one sector and uh, uh, like, uh, but they need to promote a new product that's targeted to a totally different industry. So after discussion with the client and uh, uh, also our industry experts based in China, we help the client to identify um, which region in China uh, have the most uh, um, like uh, companies in this industry, in the new industry. So to identify where the clusters are, and uh, then we also helped to, to develop um, an ideal partner profile um, so that uh, to clarify what exactly you want your partners to uh, to, to have, what, what a capability, what uh, um, like uh, uh, experience you want it. We also uh, then can like a long list and a short list uh, um, from the a huge amount of potential partners and to then recommend who will be the best few partners to work with for the client. It it's all turns out a big success for the client because they have already got several dis distributors in different regions to cover China, the, the worst country, to distribute a new product into a new sector. Um, from here, I also want to uh, mention that you may have met uh, like uh, partners from trade shows or you were introduced uh, to a new partner um, or some someone, uh, some company based in China approached you directly to uh, saying that they would like to and have the confidence to distribute your products. But it's very important, important that uh, you carry out due diligence no matter where you get your first uh, uh, Chinese partners, because uh, I've seen so many stories um, before that uh, some companies, they were introduced to a um, distributor, everything, is, uh, everything uh, went well, but then they find out that uh, the distributor might be too big for them and uh, because their product was not promoted enough and uh, they just have too many products to promote instead of focusing on your own, uh, your products. So uh, I think the, the purpose of due diligence is not only to check the credibility of the, your local partner, but also to evaluate their capability from commercial sides. And uh, that way you will be able to see or be able to find a suitable uh, and a trusted long-term partnership to avoid the risks and the disappointments of the, uh, the collaboration starts. Um, certainly um, another scenario I want to share is that uh, instead of finding distributors or maintaining the relationship from the UK, some of the companies do need ongoing business development to regularly identify new partners, negotiate new deals, and uh, to proactively um, uh, approach the stakeholders in the country. So in that, that situation, you definitely need someone on the ground uh, all the time and uh, to do the BD marketing and the partnership work. Um, but in many situations that uh, companies are not ready to set up their own business entity, 
in the market because that will involve a long process to set up as well as to maintain the on the ground operations to manage a local team far away from uh, Europe. So um, I have several clients in the similar situation. For example, uh, I have been working with a client in the past two years. It is an international education company. Uh, they are actually based, uh, headquartered in US, um, but their international uh, market team is based in the UK. They see China as um, a growth market for its digital content, but the team is too overstretched to cover the whole global market. And it's also very hard for them to have someone in their team to understand China's education market uh, at the same time have marketing and sales skills and the industry experience. So in the past two years, we provided a solution to the client that uh, is to form a team, including an account manager in the UK and uh, industry experts and marketing specialists to be the professionals on the ground in China. So the form the team uh, for this client has been working like uh, um, diligently like uh, to do all the ongoing um, uh, tasks to developing the brand image, to do the WeChat marketing, and also to reach out uh, constantly to the new customers um, and negotiate sales deals. Yeah. So this this is uh, actually um like a uh, um uh, uh, flexible and uh, viable solution for those who want to carry out uh, uh, BD marketing and other tasks, but are not ready to set up in China as yet. Um, but of course, I also have clients that uh, um are ready to set up in China. Um, uh, the the challenges for them is that uh, comparatively speaking, they are China business um, in terms of the size and skills is small, and uh, many of the operations are um, outsourced, uh, such as accounting, tax, and uh, HR. Um, but after setting up, uh, you will also need to recruit a local team. Um, but at the same time, the bilingual talents in China will be a little bit cautious to join newly established foreign-owned com foreign companies because it may mean uncertainties to their career development. Yeah. Um, I have a very long-term client who we helped to set up in, China, in Great China region. So more than one business entities in, in like uh, Greater China. Uh, after setting up, we assisted uh, on the HR and the recruitment side, uh, uh, helped them to create employee handbook and also employment agreement um, on the HR and the recruitment side, such as create uh, like uh, uh, because the, the law in China is very different to uh, here in the UK. Um, um, and after that, so we also have to transfer uh, a few colleagues from their previous business partners. And uh, um, their business is developing really well uh, in the past few years. And they have been recruiting new employees every year. But the situation is that uh, uh, their current, uh, uh, their existing recruiter um, headquartered uh, in the UK uh, can not really help them to uh, find the talents they wanted. So uh, because the differences um, in the uh, job adware channels and because of the language and also the recruitment consultant needs to have the industry experience because they are in the tech sector. So, uh, uh, but the but we manage to help them to recruit every year 
um, the um, engineers and also salespeople to join their team to make sure their vision in China can be uh, realized through their local team. So that's that's how we helped to provide um, the WHO solution. So uh, finally, I would like to share that uh, no matter which industries you are in, um, protecting your IP is definitely the first thing you need to plan uh, if you are considering to sell in the Chinese market. It can be your trademark, uh, patent, copyright, or, or domain. Yeah. So um, we are currently handling an IP case. Uh, the client invented a coffee machine that uh, uh, with its patent technology and a very beautiful design. They have already filed um, a PCT to cover China, but it's pending for approval. Uh, and uh, they had very good sales in China in the first year, but they uh, find out the sales are declining huge, uh, very dramatically in the second year. And they found out it because their their machine has been copied. So, regretfully, there's no no legal action they can take before their patent gets approval. But it could all be different if the company have already taken some actions in, at the same time of filing the patent. So. Uh, because in China, you need to think about an IP portfolio instead of just a pay in innovation patent. You can um, apply patent for your design, for your utility mode, and also trademark can also help you to uh, protect your IP. Yeah. Um, so that's the, um, the, the five scenarios and the cases I, I like to share today. And if you have any specific uh, specific questions within or beyond this, please feel free to reach out to me. I, I believe there's always a solution we can provide to you at Crayfish. Um, hope you find today's session helpful. And uh, please scan the QR code and uh, submit your feedback to, to uh, International Trade Week. Thank you.